You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Janis Pitkowski. Dr. Pitkowski is a research scientist at the MIT EAPS Department, Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Science. Dr. Pitkowski's research is focused on finding life on exoplanets, biosignature gases, and theoretical biochemistry. He is a co-author on the two papers detailing the discovery of phosphine gas in the cloud decks of Venus as well as determining that the phosphine on Venus cannot be explained by conventional processes. Janusz Petkowski, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me again, and I hope that this is going to be a very interesting interview. Because I hope that the, the viewers also will find this new data that we have and new interpretations quite interesting. Now, we have developing news with Venus, and it creates, it, it plays on, on, a, on something that has been known about Venus for several decades now, actually longer, since the 1970s, that there is strange anomalies going on in the atmosphere of this planet. And I suppose one of the first things that we saw was with Russia and the Venera missions that detected some kind of particulate matter that happened to be about the size of a bacterium in one area of Venus's atmosphere. So let's go through the history of what Venus is hints are that there may be something going on there that might be life? Well, there are there are quite a few such uh, hints and anomalies in the atmosphere or in the clouds of Venus. Well, first, the longest, probably the one of the anomalies that, that, is, uh, that is lingering or is known for the longest time is the so-called mysterious UV absorber in the top clouds of Venus. This is probably some anomaly that also the viewers are are quite familiar with because it is also in the media, it's present in the media quite often. It's some, it's some substance, it's a chemical or chemicals in the, in the top clouds of Venus that actually absorb up to 50% of all the UV light that fall onto the planet. And this is somewhat of a, of a mystery for decades now. Nobody actually knows what it is, what it could be, because people try to actually figure out, you know, if you assign this, this phenomenon to some, for example, complex sulfur chemistry, but nothing really seems to, to fit our predictions for various reasons. And this phenomenon, this UV absorber phenomenon, is actually quite peculiar also because it is quite dynamic. So it's not only, so it's not a static phenomenon, it's, it's, it changes in space and time. It also follows the quasi-seasonal changes. So this is the first and maybe the most, the oldest of the anomalies of Venus that was initially probably observed uh, with uh, photos and pictures of Venus in 1928 if I'm not mistaken. So it's actually somewhat of a mystery that is quite, quite old, almost 100 years old, and still not, not, not uh, explained. And of course, we have the very mysterious region of the clouds themselves. So, the, so this UV absorber is, is, is present in the top clouds of Venus, but the clouds are actually like a layers of various droplets or various concentrations of sulfuric acid that are like 20 kilometers thick, and they are also not uniform in their architecture and in their composition. So these clouds themselves are actually quite mysterious as well. And people were not quite sure for decades what those clouds are really made of. And, and the idea that, that, that they are made of from actually from sulfuric acid, it's maybe, maybe we, are, we, we are more or less certain about this since the 70s, when the, when the Russians were actually, and the Americans later with the Pioneer, Pioneer probe, were actually able to Send the, uh, send the probes and actually measure the cloud properties in situ out there in the clouds. But yeah, we, we essentially know that the clouds of Venus are made, that they, that they have sulfuric acid in them. So there is largely a consensus that the clouds are made of sulfuric acid. The question is, for example, how much of it it is? And also, is sulfuric acid really the main component of, this, of these clouds? Because obviously we know that the droplets or the particulates in the clouds are also quite diverse. So in the general terms, we can say that people are, people are dividing the particles in the clouds 
into three so-called moles. The smallest mole, which people do not really know exactly what it is made of, but it might be actually just smaller droplets of sulfuric acid, nobody knows. It's a small, it are small particles be around half a micron, maybe, maybe 0.4 micron across in diameter. There is also the, the so-called mode 3 particles, which are larger, and they, have, they are approximately 2 microns across in diameter, or 1 to 2 microns across in diameter. And those are quite spherical, nice particles that most likely are actually the, ex the, the liquid sulfuric acid droplets that form the majority of the particulate matter in the clouds. And there is the very controversial and the mysterious fraction of the cloud particles that, that are called the so-called mode 3 particles that have some anomalous readings associated with them that nobody really knows how to interpret it. If, of course, mode 3 particles really, really exist, because people actually tend to argue about the nature of them, of this, uh, of this mysterious larger mode 3 particles for quite a while now for approximately 40 years since they were first discovered by the probes, uh, by the Venera and, and, uh, and Pioneer probes 40 years ago. So the mode 3 particles are actually quite of an interest because they are mostly located in the lower region of the clouds in the approximately, in the altitude of approximately, let's say, from 52 to, to, to the bottom of the clouds of 48 kilometers or so. And there are some hints that they are actually larger than the, than the rest of the particles that we that we discussed, and they are approximately eight microns across, or maybe even larger than that. And most importantly, that they are not spherical. And if this indeed is true, and if the mode particles, in, mode three particles indeed exist, and if they are non-spherical, then it obviously would suggest that not all particles in the clouds of Venus are liquid, and therefore not all of them actually are most likely composed of sulfuric acid. So to summarize, we can say that sulfuric acid indeed, there it, is, it is actually a, a significant component of the clouds, but it most importantly and most likely, it's not the only component of the clouds of Venus. A couple questions related to that. Now, first of all, okay, particulate matter, is, it, is there a mechanism that anybody can think of for dust to get off of the surface of Venus and end up in this cloud layer? Or is that a, uh, a non-starter? Yes, I mean, there has to be. There, there has to be. The question is how efficient that uh, dust the transport from the surface or from the or this exchange of material between the surface of the planet and the clouds is. Because we can always imagine and that, that for example, a, 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 a fraction of this dust or, or some particulate matter would be actually transported through volcanism. We know for quite a while now that Venus is actually quite volcanically active. So it is a geologically active planet that could, in principle, transport some uh, non-volatile material into the clouds. Now, we do not know how efficient this process is. We also do not know how efficient is the process of actually transferring the material from the surface of the planet through, for example, movement of the atmosphere themselves through vertical winds and this type of transport. So definitely there is the, the surface and the clouds, they have to communicate, if I may use this word, with each other. But to what degree, it is actually quite difficult to assess. But this is actually, this, this could bring us, to bring us to another anomaly that was detected decades ago, which is the detection of various non-volatile elements in the clouds of Venus by the Venera probes. So the Venera probes, was actually, they were actually trying to detect the elemental composition or identify the elemental composition of the particulate matter of the, of the aerosols of the clouds of Venus and see what, what elements actually are, what this particulate matter is actually composed of. And this led to a very intriguing result because they were able to detect, for example, quite a significant number of amounts, relative amounts at least, of phosphorus or even iron. So if those measurements, and we probably with everything that we are going to discuss today, if, if, probably with everything, as with everything that we are going to talk, uh, talk about today, if those measurements are true, then we definitely have a proof of that. Indeed, some non-volatile elements are present in the clouds of Venus. Of course, if those Venera measurements are actually correct, this would mean that indeed there is, a, for example, a significant amount of some compounds that contain iron, 
there is a significant amount of some compounds that contain phosphorus. And as we know, phosphorus and iron are not exactly elements that form many volatile molecules, like gaseous molecules. And at the temperature regimes that the clouds are, so relatively mild, you would not expect that many volatile molecules of iron or, or phosphorus. For iron is probably nothing, no, none. And for phosphorus, well, the only, the only molecule that is actually quite volatile at these uh, lower temperatures of the cloud, well, it's phosphine. But of course, it, would, it, would, it is highly unlikely that all of the phosphorus in the clouds is actually in the form of phosphine. And phosphine discovery in itself is actually quite controversial, of course. So it's most likely some sort of phosphates, phosphate salts as well, that are somehow trapped or present in the cloud particulates. And how they are transported there in the clouds and in such amounts is actually quite of a mystery. It might be through volcanism or it might, through be, it might be through some transport, um, vertical, vertical atmospheric transport that we actually didn't assume to be that efficient. But it actually has an implications for habitability of the planet as well. We know that metals and iron, for example, is very important for all kinds of enzymatic activity of any, any kind of life that we know it. Or we know also that phosphorus, for life on Earth at least, is actually one of the critical elements that builds the backbone of the, our genetic polymer, the DNA or RNA. So having that phosphorus as well in the clouds, or at least hint that it actually could be there, it's quite important from the habitability point of view. This, of course, doesn't mean that the building blocks of life on Venus, if it even exists, if it exists on, uh, in the clouds, are actually the same. And, but nevertheless, having more of these elements that are actually normally associated with life uh, definitely improves the, the prospects for the habitability of the clouds. Now, my second question related here is, well, actually, first of all, phosphorus. This, this plays into a larger question about a phosphorus habitable zone or the phosphorus question in the Milky Way. If you don't have enough phosphorus or you have an area that's poor in it and there's some, some work in this field, then life, it might be a showstopper for life. So just the idea that Venus has phosphorus that we, we know about is a tick in the box as far as the, you know, life having a genesis, right? Oh, yes. This is actually a very good, very good question and very good point. And I, I would like to actually comment on that a little bit further, because um, if these measurements and we are going to probably repeat that uh, repeated on many occasions throughout the interview, if these measurements are correct, then so if the if the Venera measurements and detection of phosphorus in the clouds and its relative abundance are true, then it means that phosphorus is not a limiting nutrient in the clouds of Venus, because there is simply a lot of it. And in fact, we do not really know if all of the droplets in the clouds of Venus are for sure sulfuric acid. We know that the sulfuric acid is a component of the cloud, but there are some, for example, also modeling work by, by others that suggest that the bottom layers of the clouds might actually be consistent, might, might actually contain quite significant amount of phosphoric acid instead of sulfuric acid. So if that is true as well, then the amount of phosphorus that is available for any kind of hypothetical biosphere is definitely not limiting. What is actually quite limiting for this life, if it exists, is the amount of hydrogen. And this, of course, means not that it is hydrogen H2, like a molecule. It's actually everything that contains hydrogen in the molecule, because the hydro Venus is essentially quite, quite uh, hydrogen depleted. It's famously hydrogen depleted. So therefore, for example, it contains very little water, which is one of the easiest sources of hydrogen if you would like to do all kinds of reactivity or using this hydrogen for any kind of other purposes. So it might very well be, as, as, you, as you pointed out, that the nutrient limitations from planet to planet in general in the Milky Way might be actually quite different as, and that Earth's Earth's elemental abundance might not actually be exactly uh, the same everywhere. But this is difficult to say if this is a showstopper. Because what if you have very little phosphorus? What if you had 10 times less phosphorus than you have on Earth? Would that really prevent life from originating? What if you had 10 times more or 100 times less or 100 times more? We really don't know. And the reason why we don't know is we do not really know what are the true limits of life's origin and its then existence. And, I mean, 
we do not really know how life originated, so we do not really know if there are where those elemental abundance constraints really exist and how how little phosphorus is too little to actually build a build a genetic polymer that has a backbone you that uses phosphate as uh, in its structure so we don't really know that and this is actually quite of an interesting problem because it, it, it how do we know for example that that all of the solar systems have the same out there in the galaxy have the same elemental abundance and this is a very serious question and people try to for example try to build a certain for example spectral databases that try to look at stars and compare how different the elemental composition is of the of the parent star in various solar system and then you know if those if those um, if there are some differences in elemental composition between solar systems and how this could in principle in principle could translate to all the other problems like planetary formation and then of course the origin of life but this is a very difficult work to do and also it is it is rather in its infancy because it it's it, it requires a lot of data so we probably should do that more and compare this this elemental composition of of planetary systems and this and the parent stars to much greater degree than we do this now but i would argue that we really don't know what are the showstoppers for origin of life and can we for example substitute phosphorus with some other element and there are examples of life on earth like for example life that uses that lives in a open oligotrophic ocean that is very very low in abundance in phosphorus that actually that actually substitute phosphorus substitutes phosphorus as much as it can with sulfate for example it's not that it substitutes its dna this still requires phosphorus the energetic metabolism with atp and everything else also requires phosphorus but there are some means that for example certain signaling molecules are are based on sulfate or even some various cell membranes cell membrane lipids are also using sulfate from to a certain degree so the where this showstopper really is is actually quite difficult to figure out and can we actually imagine life that doesn't use phosphorus to a degree that we are uh, that life on earth here is relied upon i i just we just don't know onward to your new paper you and your colleagues this is a new paper this mix of sulfuric acid and maybe other things in the cloud decks of venus you bring up ammonia in other words ammonia salts and that they may be a significant contributing factor to the clouds of venus what are the implications of that and how would that um, those ammonia salts be formed realistically on venus the implications are huge mostly for habitability of of venus of venusian clouds if the model that we present is true then implications for habitability of the clouds are pretty huge. But to answer that question, we essentially have to step back a little bit and go back to the original work by Dr. Paul Rimmer from the University of Cambridge. Because he had, Paul Rimmer is one of the really talented experts and, and essentially an, the expert of, in, the, in the atmospheric photochemistry, together with uh, also other members of our group like Dr. Sukri Tranjan. So what Paul Rimmer was actually trying to do is trying he was trying to explain some of the long-lasting anomalies in the clouds of venus so we know from various measurements either through a telescopes in, from earth either observations through telescopes uh, on earth or through in situ measurements from various probes that we that we've sent uh, over the years to Ven into venusian clouds we more or less know how much of of, of what gas we have where of course there is a lot of a lot of unknowns as everywhere but the profiles the abundance profiles of the of the gases are more or less known from the observations so what people do next is they is they know more or less what they measured and what they observed so they try to build a complex chemical models of the entire atmosphere that involve everything from photochemistry to various thermochemical processes to diffusion and so on so on the uv processes the UV light processes that also happen in the atmosphere, in the in the top of the atmosphere, and everything 
And all of those models that are actually built that contain thousands of, of possible reactions and hundreds of species of chemical species that could participate, try to model what actually, how the atmosphere should look like if we understand the chemical processes in the atmosphere correctly. And if those models do not match the observed values, then it means that we have something that is probably wrong with our, in our model that doesn't really reflect the reality well. And we try to adjust the model properly to that, to, to match the observations. And this is essentially how science should work. We have a model, the model doesn't match the observation. We change, we try to change and adjust the model's parameters to actually better reflect the reality that we observe. So one of such anomalies, observational anomalies that Paul Rimmer was struggling to, ex to explain was the unusual abundance profile of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere of Venus in the clouds. And the reason, and basically what it means is that the sulfur dioxide has this spectacular depletion in the clouds. So it's essentially somewhat, uh, it's, 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 it's suddenly depleted in the clouds and you would not expect this depletion from the known chemistry of the atmosphere or known photochemistry and known chemistry and known models of the, of the atmosphere. So what Paul Rimmer actually did is he embarked on the process of, on the quest to explain this long lasting, uh, very mysterious depletion of the sulfur dioxide in the clouds of Venus. And this might sound like it's actually something quite mundane, but in reality, his explanation for this depletion has profound for profound impact of on the on the habitability of the clouds, if correct, of course. And this always has to this, this always has to be mentioned. So what it mean, what Paul Rimmer actually did that others didn't do is that he included in his in his model of the chemistry of the atmosphere he included the cloud chemistry. He included chemistry that could happen in the sulfuric acid droplets of the clouds something that other models didn't really model very well. And what actually Mo Rimmer model proposed is to explain this depletion of sulfur dioxide by providing, by assuming that there, what if there is some sort of a base, a neutralizing compound chemical that neutralizes these sulfuric acid droplets to a certain level and then allowing, therefore, through complex chemical processes, allowing this sulfur dioxide that will diffuse into the liquid droplet, dissolve into this liquid droplet, and by that it's becoming, it becomes trapped in these droplets, essentially. So what he, in, in long story short, in a, in a sort of a simplified manner, what he, what he assumed is that there is something that neutralizes the sulfuric acid of the cloud droplet, therefore allowing the sulfuric acid to dissolve in the liquid droplets to form salts with this neutralizing, neutralizing um, uh, compound. This has an unbelievable implication because it essentially matches. So Paul Rimmer's model with this complicated sulfuric acid droplet chemistry matches the observed value of, of the sulfur dioxide. If you assume that the pH of the cloud droplets is one or around one. And we have to now contrast this with the acidity of the pure sulfuric acid droplet, which cannot even be put in context of the regular pH scale. And we have to go to the so-called Hammett acidity scale, which it would be in equivalent terms minus 11. So you see, you suddenly have a sulfuric acid droplet that if it contains some neutralizing compound inside, it can actually explain the observed anomalous profile of the sulfuric acid, uh, of, the, of the sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. Not only that, but suddenly the profile of water vapor above the clouds, for various complicated chemical reasons, also matches the observations better. So now, obviously, the, the, the obvious question is that if Paul Rimmer's model of the complex chemistry in the clouds is true, then there is a question what is this neutralizing compound that is sitting inside of the sulfuric acid droplet and neutralizes this acid and at the same time allows this sulfur, sulfur dioxide to match the, 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 in the model to match the observed values.
And, uh, and in initial model of, by Paul Rima, he assumed that this could be some sort of mineral salts, for example, that are lofted up from the, from the surface of the planet or delivered, for example, volcanically, and then they can dissolve in the droplets and essentially act as, as this neutralizing, neutralizing agent. And these minerals, for example, he assumed that it could be, for example, sodium hydroxide, but there could be other, other, other minerals that could act as these neutralizers as well. So we postulate, um, and in our subsequent paper together, which we also did, of course, together with Paul Rimmer and, and, and his model, we postulate that this ne mysterious neutralizing pace that allows us to suddenly match the model's prediction with the observations, with these anomalous observations of sulfuric acid, of sulfur, sulfur dioxide, is ammonia. And why ammonia is such, a, such an elegant and at the same time mm, attractive and neutralizing agent to explain these observations is, is because you do not necessarily need suddenly a complicated transport of my minerals from the surface to the clouds 50 kilometers up, but you actually, in principle, could make this ammonia in situ within the clouds simply from the molecular nitrogen N2. And you, of course, and or the viewers might be quite skeptical about this, how you are actually making the ammonia in situ in the clouds of Venus. I mean, it, might, it is a very difficult process to do from the, from the a nitrogen from the molecular nitrogen. And you would be absolutely correct because it is a very energetically consuming and very energetically e e inefficient, so to speak, a process. And on Earth, it happens uh, mostly through biology. Our, our, our bacteria on Earth are capable of fixing nitrogen and two from the atmosphere and actually making ammonia as an end, re end result. So the hypothesis could be, for example, that there is some process, something, let's say, and very hypothetically, of course, that could in principle live in the cloud, in the cloud droplet and neutralize it in the process by fixing the nitrogen and producing ammonia. And in the process, neutralizing the, the acid in the droplet to habitable levels. Because we have to remember that the so-called hamet acidity of minus 11 is not habitable by any life that, as we know it, while the pH 1 that suddenly is, is required in Paul Rimmer's model to match the observation of, of uh, sulfur dioxide suddenly is. So if you, have, if you produce enough of this neutralizing agent to have the pH 1, it actually implies that the cloud droplets are actually potentially much more habitable than we previously thought, at least in terms of the challenge for life, that is the extreme acidity of the clouds, because obviously the, the scarcity of water in this regard also uh, still persists and is a separate challenge. But what is quite elegant in the model, in the Paul Rimmers, in the new version of the Paul Rimmers, of the, of the Rimmers model, is that if you assume the production of ammonia in the clouds, or you use the ammonia as an input for the photochemical model or the, chemi or the chemical model of Paul Rimmer, then you automatically as a consequence, as a natural consequence, are able to explain the long-lasting anomalies in the clouds of Venus that go beyond this initial mysterious observation of the depletion of sulfur dioxide in the clouds. So suddenly there is this one element by ammonia that is capable of explaining much more than just the rather, at the first glance, mundane looking problem of the depletion of sulfur dioxide in the clouds. It's worth hammering home here how important and uh, how much we actually use this because the idea of uh, bacteria fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere is the basis of agriculture in on earth. In other words, we we fertilize with anhydrous ammonia and grow all this corn and rice and everything that we do all based on life producing ammonia. And so if the same process is happening at, at Venus, then there's gonna be a byproduct. So there's a, yet another Venus anomaly here, oxygen, the presence of O2. How does that fit into the model? So what is, what is actually quite important from the point of view of the Rimmer's model is that the production of oxygen in the clouds of Venus that was detected by both Pioneer 13 probes 
and Venera 14 and 15 probes is a natural consequence of this ammonia production. Now, how does this happen? How does this could happen in principle? Of course, of course, we are. This is a hypothesis. This is a this is a theory. We, of course, do not have the proof um, that that this happens like that in in reality. If you when you actually fix the nitrogen, uh, you need to provide two things. You need to, you need to provide hydrogens to this nitrogen to actually produce ammonia, and to the, the molecular nitrogen in the atmosphere doesn't have any hydrogens around it. So to, to make ammonia, which is NH3, you need to provide these three hydrogens. So you need to find a molecule that's going to be a donor of these hydrogens, essentially. And in Venus, and this is where we're actually, uh, this, is, this is where we, where, where we actually go to challenges to, for life in the Venusian clouds. Because like on Earth, we, we are always saying that, okay, uh, for example, phosphorus is a limiting factor, the, the abundance of phosphorus and so on. On Venus, such limiting factor for life is not phosphorus, for example, but hydrogen, but, 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 and by extension, for example, water. So if you fix the nitrogen, you need to provide this hydrogen so you actually can produce ammonia as a result. This takes a lot of energy, of course, but it also takes a lot of this hydrogen-containing molecule. The obvious uh, source of hydrogen, so you can plug those hydrogens onto the nitrogen and basically produce ammonia, is water. So you, what you actually do is you take nit molecular nitrogen, you, if, when you would like to fix it, uh, and you add water. You not add, but you, and do, you, you do it through biological, biochemical process, of course, not... And then essentially you resu the result is the production of ammonia. As a result of this biological, potential biological fixation of, of, of nitrogen and the production of ammonia, as a waste product of this type of reaction, you need to have a very oxidized product, very oxidized chemical as a waste product. And if you think about it, you take molecular nitrogen, you, you take the source of hydrogens from water, and as a result you have ammonia, which is NH3, yes, and then, and then obviously as a, as a waste product, the obvious, obvious waste product of that type of fixation of, of, of molecular nitrogen, of atmospheric nitrogen, would be O2, yes. So if you imagine that this type of nitrogen fixation actually can happen in the droplet, then the, then the obvious consequence of this production of ammonia could be molecular oxygen. This has to. This we can go back to the to the detections of oxygen and and in the atmosphere or in the clouds of Venus because these detections were made 40 years ago by both the Russians and Americans. The Venera probes, Venera 14 and Venera 13 probes, were able to actually detect uh, detect oxygen O2 in parts per million levels, in tens of parts per million levels. So it's so, of course, not as much as we have here on Earth in our atmosphere, but tens of parts per million levels is actually quite significant amount that cannot be readily explained by normal geological or photochemical processes in the clouds of Venus. Or at least this is another anomaly. That's why we call about anomalies. And this detection was then confirmed. Uh, I mean, basically, Russians and the Americans confirmed and agreed, uh, agreed on that that yes, indeed, both Pioneer 13 or Pioneer Venus probe, as well as as well as well um, Venera probes, indeed detected these parts, tens of parts per million uh, levels of oxygen in the cloud decks and a little bit below, um, actually in the cloud decks of Venus. And this is actually quite remarkable that both we have, we have multiple pro probes that, that point to the same thing, the oxygen in the clouds of Venus. And both of them roughly agree also on the abundance of this of this of this oxygen. So this actually gives us maybe a little bit more confidence that who knows maybe this detection indeed is correct. And people ignored this observation for decades. Nobody could, no models whatsoever, no models, no previous models could actually explain the parts per million levels or tens of parts per million levels in the at in the clouds of clouds of Venus. So this was a critical, typical anomaly of the clouds of Venus. 
And then when Paul Rimmer stepped into the foray, he not only was able to, to explain with his new cloud chemistry model, not only this sulfur dioxide depletion, but by implementing ammonia into this as this neutralizing agent in his model, he was able to also explain the oxygen production if you implement the particular uh, chemistry um, chemistry that that we hypothetically propose for the for the production of ammonia. And as a result of that chemistry, the oxygen is the waste product. And what is quite interesting about it is that the oxygen, that the fixation of nitrogen with water as a source of hydrogen and the production of oxygen as a so-called waste product, you actually have the most water efficient and energy efficient way of producing ammonia from nitrogen fixation. So if you were, hypothetically speaking, a biological uh, entity or some life form that has to produce ammonia because otherwise you would die because essentially you have to lower the acidity of, of a droplet to livable levels, then you would choose the reaction that costs the least amount of energy and that costs the least amount of water. Because as we established, the, the, the actual limiting nutrient in the Venusian clouds is hydrogen and is water. The water problem is always going to be present. This is something that everybody will fight if something lives there. Everybody will fight for to get water. So, of course, this reaction, this fixation uh, of atmospheric nitrogen is a highly energetically costly reaction. So it always takes energy to, to do this. So it's not that this is some, something that life will make lightly. But if everybody in the clouds, let's say, doesn't have a choice, then you just have to do it because otherwise you just cannot survive. But what is the implication of the Rimmer's model as also is that he actually with his ammonia, uh, with, the, uh, with the inclusion of ammonia in this, in this photochemical and chemical model, he is able to explain multiple of anomalies that were simply unexplained previously or completely ignored, uh, like, for example, the detections of oxygen. So what we are actually able to do is we do not have to discard the observations that were done before, but we actually can modify our models to not only encompass everything that we knew before about, the, about Venus, but to encompass some measurements that were discarded because nobody actually knew how to implement them into the model. And of course, this has another implications. The Rimmer, the new ammonia model Rimmer, Rimmer model, has another implication, is that the, the formation of this or the neutralization of the sulfuric acid in the cloud droplets actually leads to the formation of salts in, the, in, the, in these particles. And this brings us to the, to, the, to the beginning of our interview, when we talked about the initial measurements of the probes done by, for example, Pioneer Venus probe, that suggests that, that, the, that the bottom clouds, that the mid to bottom clouds, mid to lower clouds of, the, of, the, of, of Venus, contain some particles that are indeed larger and non-spherical. And this, to a degree, could fit with the prediction that if you actually did indeed produce some sort of neutralizing agent, either through mineral, mineral delivery from the surface or through ammonia production uh, in the clouds, you actually would end up having, uh, having a, a salty slurry, so to speak, in the bottom, in the mid to lower, lower layers of the clouds. So this would also explain this anomalous, uh, so to, uh, and this anomalous measurements of non-spherical droplets at the bottom of the clouds. So we do not have to, in principle, assume that those early measurements by Pioneer Venus were erroneous. They might have been, we don't know that, but, but we, might, we, might, we do not have to immediately assume that they indeed were wrong. This sounds suspiciously like something evolution would do. In other words, as Venus died and became increasingly acidic, any life that may have formed there in you know, the uh, hypothesized oceans of Venus would adapt any way it possibly could to neutralize the acid environment and try to keep it as sort of similar, sort of similar to how 
we ourselves still carry the ocean in our bloodstream in the form of a, a slightly saline mix. This, it's, it's keeping an environment that it once had by neutralizing the sulfuric acid because it had enough time to evolve to be able to produce ammonia to neutralize it. So this starts sounding a lot like evolution at work on a world that died, but life found a sort of way to continue going on. And um, <laughs> so how do we prove this? Uh, how do we go there and, and determine if Venus's atmosphere is alive? We have to revisit the, we have to check First of all, if these Venusian anomalies that we are talking now and that Paul and that suddenly Rimmer models, new Rimmer model actually predicts or, or, or explains, not predicts, but explains, are indeed there. So we might have these uh, isolated measurements, some of them more robust and uh, believable than others. Like, for example, the oxygen measurement is pretty, is pretty solid. I mean, of course, it, everything might be wrong, but the fact that it was measured twice by two different probes or even three times if you consider Venera 13 as well. And by both by Americans and by the Russians, it's actually quite confident. So you actually would have to, or in for the new missions to Venus or, or hopefully in situ, try to dive into these clouds and actually measure these this chemical anomalies again. Starting from ammonia, which is the central player and in the in the Venusian in the in the new Paul, Paul Rimmer's model, what what this actually and you might ask, okay, you are you are invoking this ammonia suddenly as this neutralizing agent of the cloud droplets. Do you have any evidence that ammonia is indeed there in the Venusian clouds? And remarkably, yes, of course, a very tentative measurements, but so by all means, not a proof of ammonia. You might even argue, is there real evidence of it? But the tentative evidence of the ammonia in the clouds of Venus, we do have indeed. And again, both by the Russians and Americans. So an early probe of Venera 8 had a specific chemical probe or chemical sensor for detection of ammonia. So they, they actually built a rather old school, nice uh, chemical sensor that was supposed to detect ammonia in the clouds. This was from the time when people didn't really exactly know what was the main constituent of the clouds of Venus. And they were suggesting that maybe there are some parallels with, with the clouds of Jupiter, for example. So ammonia might be a significant component of the clouds. So why not build an ammonia sensor? And Interestingly, when the probe actually visited the clouds and dove into the clouds, it gave positive results in the clouds and below the cloud, actually below the, a little bit below the clouds of ammonia detection. Now, we don't know, and, this has, and we have to be extremely honest here, we don't know if this detection is actually to be believed, mostly because these particular sensors were not exactly 100% resistant to sulfuric acid. So there might be, there might be a situation for although we don't know what happened, that the positive result from the Venera 8 detection of ammonia or tentative detection of ammonia came from an unfortunate reactivity of the sensor itself with sulfuric acid. Although, of course, it might also be that the detection is indeed correct. We, just, we will just not know until we measure this ammonia again. And then the very interesting reanalysis of the Pioneer 13 or Pioneer Venus mass spectrometry came to be in 2021, which was done by Professor Rakesh Mogul. So in this, in this case, we do not have a chemical sensor like the Russians had for the ammonia, but we have the neutral gas mass spectrometer. So it was a spectrometer that was that mass spectrometer that was measuring or trying to identify various gases in the atmosphere of Venus and specifically the clouds as well, the cloud decks as well. And the recent reanalysis of the of this uh, chemical composition of the clouds by Professor Rakesh Mogul gave us a tentative detection of ammonia as well. So not a proof, of course, that ammonia is indeed there. It is very difficult to assign mass, mass, uh, this, uh, this mass peaks for for ammonia because of because it actually overlaps with uh, quite significantly with other species so there are all kinds of difficulties in the data analysis but there is indeed uh, in this fascinating paper by professor rakesh mogul a hint that indeed ammonia is there 
in the in the mass spectra. This is of course not a, not a proof. We have to go there and figure this out. There are reanalysis of the Pioneer 13 data. Also, this is a little bit of a of a tangent, but important to point out is that the reanalysis of the mass spe mass spectrometer data from from Pioneer Venus also led to detection of other nitrogen species, more oxidized, like various nitrogen oxides, that are the components of the Earth's nitrogen cycle. So if, those re if this reanalysis and reinterpretation of the Pioneer Venus data is correct, then you could imagine that together with ammonia, we essentially have the, all the components that we need to close the nitrogen cycle in Venusian clouds as it happens here on Earth. And of course, ammonia is also a central element of the nitrogen cycle, of the biological nitrogen cycle. So the first thing that we have to confirm is the presence of ammonia. Then we would have to confirm that indeed, for example, the oxygen, oxygen um, detection is correct. We also should confirm, for example, the uh, acidity of the droplets. And if indeed the droplets are made of concentrated sulfuric acid, we now so strongly suspect that the droplets are not uniform, that they are not homogeneous, that there are many, many, diff that they are actually quite, quite chemically um, diverse, and that indeed the bottom layer of the clouds, like the, the mid to bottom layer of the clouds, might actually be, uh, pre might actually be composed of these non-spherical uh, droplets that have, uh, you know, by definition, a different composition than, than a regular liquid sulfuric acid droplet. So the measure, re remeasuring of the sphericity of the droplets, of their sizes, and also the, the, the analysis of the chemical composition of the aerosols in general and the particulates in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the clouds of Venus is a paramount. Not to mention an obvious elephant in the room, so to speak, although I do not know if I use this, this idiom properly in this context, is the presence of organics in the clouds of Venus. Nobody before ever asked this question or tried to measure organic material in the clouds of Venus. We have very sort of tentative and rather unreliable hints, again from the Pioneer Venus mass spectrometer, that the volatile hydrocarbons are present in the atmosphere of Venus. This, however, has to be taken with a huge grain of salt because those hydrocarbons could be contaminant of the spacecraft or the probe itself. So it might not come, not necessarily come from the, from the atmosphere of Venus there itself, but it might actually be a contaminant. But we, again, we do not know. We, will not, we do not know if this is indeed a native, mole, no, a native hydrocarbons that come from the atmosphere of Venus, or it is actually something we, we brought, brought up, to, brought up from, from Earth, or, or that this is a, some unfortunate reactivity of the of the probe itself. So we just don't know. But the question, are there any organics in the cloud decks that is open? Are there any hydrocarbons uh, as there? For example, methane is open. It was detected and it was considered an error of, and, and contaminant. And, and this, this is likely a contaminant, but we have to just remeasure this with, with our modern, modern uh, technology. Now, uh, not to throw something else into the mix, the idea of um, sulfur and sulfur compounds possibly aiding in surviving in that environment. The S8 molecule, that life could possibly armor itself against the sulfuric or acidic environment as well, in addition to neutralizing it. So what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I would say that uh, this is a very, inter very intriguing problem. We have to constantly remind ourselves in astrobiology in general, and maybe I am a little bit of a, uh, of a radical member of the astrobiology school of thought, but we shouldn't follow, extremely follow, what, what we have, the analogy with Earth, life on Earth. We have to be ready for something unexpected, for evolutionary solutions to problems that our life on Earth never even had to solve or never even faced so it doesn't have an incentive to solve it so the problem of this concentrated sulfuric acid environment is such there is literally no environment here on earth that could be an analog of the clouds of venus like it doesn't exist so our life on earth never had to adapt to this type of acidity to this level of acidity that is beyond any kind of acidity that our life has our, our life on earth survives, 
nor it had to adapt to an environment that is so water scarce, that essentially is, is extremely dry, 50 to 100 times drier than the Atacama Desert. If, of course, the global abundance of water is indeed correct. And because there might be, and we can talk a little bit about that later, there might be some local pockets of higher water uh, abundance in the Venusian clouds. So the, so the clouds might be actually dry in general, in the global terms, in the planetary terms, but there might be a micro, not micro, micro or some smaller, smaller pockets where the water activity is actually much higher. So that is another problem. So whenever we look for life elsewhere, we have to anticipate what environment this life could actually exist in and see if we actually can apply any type of Earth's analogy to this environment. Because in this case, in the case of clouds of Venus, if we were to actually study its habitability, then obviously from the point of view of the habitability of, of being inhabited by Earth-like microbes, it's an impossibility. It's, 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 it's impossible. for Even if we take one, micro, even the most hardy extremophile from Earth and put it in the clouds of Venus, it would not survive. Why? Because it never had to ever, in its his evolutionary history on life on Earth, it never had to adapt to such an environment. So life on Venus would have to have protective shells or all kinds of mechanisms, not even shells, I mean any, every, any, any biochemical solutions to these two problems. This extreme acidity and a problem that is also related to a degree, uh, extreme dryness of the clouds. So, as one, as one of my friends and our collaborators, Dr. Sukri Tranjan, uh, once said, and I really like this, this statement, habitability is a frontier to be explored, is not, a, is not an absolute dogma. So that's, we always have to have that in mind, because we have, to have, we have to realize that evolution might actually find solutions to, to problems that we didn't dream of, really, or about those solutions. So, for example, we can have three different possible paths for life to, to survive in the clouds of Venus. We might go, we might start from the most science fiction solution, which is essentially using sulfuric acid as a solvent. This is a very, un, a very unexpected possibility. We do not know, uh, we do not know if life can exist on, in, based on other solvents, but who knows? maybe it actually can, it just would need a completely, completely different organic usage of completely different organic chemistry, not any kind of chemistry, not, not chemistry like we have or, or organic chemistry like we have. So no DNA, no proteins, no nothing of that sort. It would have to be a completely different genetic polymer, different executive branch of our biochemistry. So different protein-like polymers, but not proteins, of course, and so on. So this is one of the most science fiction solutions to the problem of sulfuric acid clouds or liquid is to just use it as a solvent instead of water. Well, might be might be a little bit far fetched. The second one might be okay. Maybe you would be able to build something that would protect you from this sulfuric acid while you actually happily live live in the in the clouds, protected from this sulfuric acid. This is this is possible, of course. But the difficulty is that you would have to have that you would have a lot of gradients, various gradients. You know, you would, assuming that you have water inside and you have this sulfuric acid inside, outside, and so on, you have a lot of a lot of problems in maintaining this barrier. And the barrier cannot be cannot be essentially uh, impermeable because the whole point is, if you are alive, that you actually communicate with the outside environment. But this is again something that is that is not completely impossible because. I mean, we know that there are all kinds of materials that actually could be resistant to sulfuric acid. So having like a sulfur shell is one of those possibilities. Uh, the problem is how to regulate it so you actually control when to open it and when to close it, because you always have to have to have a contact with your environment, outside environment, and how to manage the, the exchange with the environment. But there is also a third, uh, third solution that we actually discussed today, is what if life on Venus actually makes its own environment? What if it actually deals with the problem of sulfuric acid by just getting rid of it? To, 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 to talk a little bit, uh, to say it a little bit colloquially, uh, it's by neutralizing it. 
And this is essentially what, what, what Rimmer's model proposes, is that you do not have to have like some absolutely super, um, super difficult to imagine alternative biochemistry. You even do not have to have that much of a different barriers. You just need to modify your environment so it so it to the level that it becomes habitable for the living organism there. And if you ask yourself a question, do we have any? And this is basically where we when we think about habitability or places, other planets that might be quite different than ours. You could ask ourselves a question then, are there any evolutionary adaptations here on Earth that could suggest that such neutralization, for example, happens? And indeed, of course, the, the, the very, the very, the very um, interesting observation is that indeed there are organisms, microorganisms here on Earth that use ammonia as a neutralizing agent. And yet to a degree, a similar spatial context, to put it this way. So there are organisms that, for example, are secreting ammonia, uh, pumping it outside, to neutralize a droplet size acidic environments within the macrophages or, or um, white immune cells of our organism. So, for example, there are some various pathogenic bacteria that, uh, if they are unfortunately um, or fortunately for us, but unfortunately for them, eaten or, 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 or captured by our uh, phagocytes, for example, by our immune system, then they are essentially en enclosed in a little tiny vesicle uh, or a droplet-like vesicle that this, um, this little white blood, white blood cell is filling in with acid just to chop this bacterium, this captured bacterium into pieces. And this bacterium detects that essentially, oh, suddenly I am in this acid environment. How do I survive this, this problem? And actually what happens is that this bacterium produces a lot of ammonia, not through complicated nitrogen fixation process as we, as we discussed today, but through other means, but nevertheless analogously using ammonia as a neutralizing agent in the context of a one single droplet, which is quite interesting. Because you might also ask a question, and from the evolutionary standpoint, you know, are there any examples of organisms that actually um, neutralize their little ponds in which they live? Let's say that we have a we have a small lake, and you suddenly start to to have a colony of bacteria that try to ne neutralize this acidic ponds pond they live in, and that in principle could be could be actually. Um, uh, and, and a strategy, an evolutionary strategy, but it wouldn't be a good one and it wouldn't be a stable, strategy, a sta stable evolutionary strategy because to adopt this, uh, this pH of the, of the larger pond would take a lot of energy and at the same time they would be vulnerable to be colonized by any kind of freeloaders or parasitic, parasitic microorganisms that just live there for free and do not co contribute energetically to the production of the neutralizing ammonia. So those ammonia neutralizing bacteria would get extinct. So essentially the size, the scale of the neutralization of the entire pond or the river is, is, probably, is probably prohibitive. That's why we do not really see such a strategy. On Earth, we actually see just the adaptation to live in the acidic environment. And since we never actually see a pond of sulfuric acid, a concentrated sulfuric acid, to a degree that it exists in the clouds of Venus, our life never actually even had to deal with this problem beyond actually living in the, in the rather dilute acid environments as compared to, 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 um, to the clouds of Venus. But the, if, you, if you neutralize a single droplet in the clouds, this droplet essentially has to be neutralized only once, and it become and belongs to you forever. And if somebody is trying to steal this droplet from you, then essentially the only thing that happens is that the dwellers of the inhabitants of one droplet might die and not the entire ecosystem as it would happen if we try to uh, neutralize the entire pond. So this is a, maybe a rather lengthy explanation from the evolutionary point of view, but it also makes sense from the evolutionary standpoint to actually use ammonia as a neutralizing agent because it is, it is actually once neutralized, 
the droplet stays neutralized and it's effectively yours, yours by, by or the microorganisms that actually that actually invested energy and ammonia production to to its neutralization. And this might actually be also a very important point. Now it's worth noting here that the idea of life creating its own environment more broadly speaking than just neutralizing pH more broadly speaking earth is worse we're sitting here breathing air because of photosynthesizing plants producing oxygen and there was a time when this planet had very little oxygen and then all of a sudden there was the great oxygenation event which is a direct absolute undisputed event that was caused by life so we ourselves are sitting here sucking oxygen because of another organism so why couldn't something simpler than that happen on venus where it can just simply neutralize its environment and get the acidity down to uh, fit its comfort zone it's it's not that much it's not that it's not a big claim compared to earth it's well it's not except that of course it the the one from the from the polarimers calculation we to you know to to match the models with observations you would need actually quite significant production of ammonia yes so, so this the investment. So one thing that we really have to have in mind that this really costs a lot of energy to do, and you have to produce quite a bit, significant amount of ammonia. That is not prohibitive, of course. It's not. It's not amounts of ammonia that are completely impossible or doesn't or do not make sense, or suddenly everything collapses, you know, because of that. But it is a significant expense. But. If this is the only way to just survive and everybody has to do it, then maybe it's actually the way to go. Yes. Um, and if there is a limited way of actually cheating on survival, yes, because everybody essentially, let's speculate quite a bit, uh, everybody is living in separate liquid droplets, then that is a possibility. But of course, it also depends it, it depends on the energetic expenditure, and the the more water you have to expend to spend on it, the better. So this is where basically where where we again go back to the very beginning of the of the uh, of our interview is that the limiting nutrient on Venus is hydrogen and by extension essentially water. The more water, if if you suddenly live in this hypothetical, I mean, pockets of of actual higher water activity, and there were measurements both by Pioneer, Pioneer Venus and Venera probes that suggest that there are pockets in the clouds, potentially, that are actually uh, much more wet than the global or the, the surroundings. So, so it is not impossible that we actually have, um, have a situation in which this life periodically has these maybe blooms, let's say, when this ability to actually neutralize these droplets and uh, and do all kinds of uh, biochemical activities is much more favorable than we would than we would think because of course the the production of ammonia through these mechanisms that that we described in the pol in the in the Rimmer models model are mm, are indeed quite energetically costly so we have that we have to have that in mind but as as dr ian malcolm said uh, life uh, finds a way, and uh, who knows, maybe it actually found a way on Venus. Now, to come full circle, blooms. Now, this gets back to what we started on, the unknown UV absorber, which seems to do things like bloom. It changes, moves, and this is the greatest, perhaps, and earliest hint that something's going on at Venus with the UV absorbers, and that we might have been seeing the activities of life this whole time ever since we got our first close-up look at venus when we you know flew by it and we looked at it we said well there aren't any trees or you know things like science fiction thought used to be there there's no jungle or anything like that but we might have missed that there was microbes and that they might have actually been visible from space now the uv absorbers provide something one last puzzle piece for life in other words, at least in terms of our discussion, an energy source. If we're talking about a truly alien occurrence of life, could ultraviolet radiation from the sun be the driving force? I, I would say that it is to a degree 
an evolutionary no-brainer that if you are uh, an aerial, a strictly aerial biosphere with no contact, no direct contact to the surface, then the one uh, nutrient, so to speak, that you have plenty of in the clouds is light, is electromagnet, is, is the radiation. So essentially, you would assume that some form photos of photosynthesis is on the table. And it's not only, and something that you could speculate also, on Earth, the photosynthesis is, is generally, you could say, generally across the board, used for carbon fixation. But is there a possibility that indeed this type of photochemical processes, the biophotochemical processes or photosynthetic processes are utilized to much greater extent than, than, uh, than on Earth? and to, for reactions that not necessarily lead to carbon fixation. And I think that it is the case, it might be the case. There are limited um, information from a couple of years, some papers from a couple of years that, that, ha that were suggesting some photosynthetic or photodependent processes that led to the increase of the ATP budget in the af aphids, in these little insects called, called aphids. And there were these complex carotenoids underneath their cuticle that actually responded to light that in turn led to the formation of larger, of greater amounts of ATP, if I recall correct, correctly this study. So if this study with the aphid carotenoids is true, then this was a first hint that the photosynthesis doesn't necessarily always have to involve carbon fixation, but it might be, might be actually used for all kinds of other energy sources. There are all kinds of other various so-called radiotrophy, for example, which is much more, uh, I would say, peculiar way of, uh, of survival and using actually another, another means of, of, of energy to run, its, uh, run, run biochemical processes. So I would say that if there is plenty of energy available, for example, from the sun, then life would find a way to use it for more chemical processes than just a simple carbon fixation, like it is on Earth. The one a tangent, the tangential information actually that, uh, that might be actually quite interesting for the viewers is that our model, our so the Paul Rimmer model with the ammonia as an input explains these various chemical anomalies quite well. And it even explains for the first time the presence of oxygen in the clouds of Venus, but quite funny, but in a sort of a, in a, in a sort of a uh, funny result, we predict with the ammonia production and the, and the Paul Rimmer's model, we predict too little of this oxygen. So the actual values that were measured by Pioneer Venus and, uh, and the Venera probes are approximately 10 times to, to 20 times larger than the oxygen production predicted by the Paul Rimmer's model. So you could, of course, if the measurements are true and so on, and who knows, maybe the error bar is a little bit higher and so on. So under the assumption that the measurements are indeed what they are, you could speculate that the oxygen production in the clouds of Venus and its potential explanation by the neutralizing activity of ammonia and production of ammonia with the release of oxygen as a as a byproduct, is an insufficient source to explain the oxygen in the clouds. It is a step in the right direction because there is literally no other way, no other model that actually was able to explain this, but it might be insufficient still. So what if the rest, the ten, the, the rest of the oxygen that is actually produced, what if the rest of oxygen in the clouds of Venus actually comes from something more mundane in quotation in, in quotation marks what if it actually could in principle come from the our good old oxygenic photosynthesis we cannot exclude that of course and this is just a speculation our model uh, is better than any other model that was previously previously published of course and it explains all kinds of other anomalies and we do not have to discard the observations or we do not have to discard the data to just to just uh, 
um, uh, make our to fit to, to fit our model to the observations. So that's an improvement. But in, indeed, uh, even if we actually explain this oxygen in the clouds, we need more of it to to actually fully explain the observations, which is extremely interesting thing if you think about it, because it means that there's indeed something else that also produces this oxygen to a to a much much greater to a, to a significantly greater degree apart from the from the oxygen from the ammonia production venus hints indeed and that's it's been doing it for a long time now and it just seems to continue to mount thanks for joining us today doctor and next time next discovery at venus i, I hope you come back thank you it's a pleasure Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.